I'll thank you. I have a series of questions. I have not asked my questions. I was saving them for last. Um, uh, but, and then after my questions, we'll adjourn. You, you said that Russia's and aggression in Ukraine, port congestion and COVID lockdowns in China especially have contributed to higher prices. Consumer uh, spending continues to be strong. Many Americans, most Americans probably worry about inflation. Talk, talk for a moment, if you would, about the strengths of the American economy now and whether or not you see positive signs of prices stabilizing. Well, um Consumers are overall, not every consumer, uh, but overall the consumer sector is in very strong shape financially. There's, as you know, a very substantial accumulated quantity of, uh, of savings on balance sheets, less so at the very bottom of the income spectrum, but right across the rest of the spectrum. And so that's there to support spending even in the face of higher inflation. And you're seeing consumer spending hold up uh, pretty well. Um, sorry, the rest of your question. Well, was, are there positive signs of prices stabilizing? So, in terms of prices stabilizing, uh, you know, what we're what we're looking for is, you know, compelling evidence that inflation is coming down, and we we don't have that. So, nothing I could point to says that we have that. I will say that core PCE inflation is a, is a pretty good indicator of where underlying inflation is is running. Um, and and it, it has moderated the, over the course of this year reasonably significantly from where it was uh, in the latter part of last year, still way uh, higher than it needs to be. We need to see a lot more progress. Uh, but just it's been running at a rate over the last, say, four, four or five months that is, that is lower than it was, at least. But again, still, still far too high. So we're looking for that. We're not really seeing it yet. Uh, you know, there, there are lots of, of stories about there, out there how this should happen, and, and uh, some people think it's very clear that it will. And you know, until we actually do see it happen, uh, we need to keep keep um, keep moving. And I want to be clear from your comments publicly, your comments to this committee today. Uh, you see the you you say the economy is not at the point of a recession, correct? I don't see the <clears throat> the likelihood of a recession as particularly elevated right now. You should know that um, no one is very good at forecasting forecasting uh, uh, recessions it, it very far out. We're, we're just we just no, no one's been able to do that regularly. So, but I, I would say that um, you know the U.S. economy for now is strong, and uh, spending is strong. Consumers are in good shape. Businesses are in good shape. Clearly, financial conditions have tightened, and you're seeing growth slow from the very elevated levels of last year associated with the reopening. You're, you're, you're seeing the beginnings of job growth slowing to more sustainable levels. And, you know, there's risk in that. There's, there's obviously risk in that. We, monetary policy is famously a blunt tool, and there's risk that, uh, that weaker outcomes are certainly possible, but they're not our intent. And as I said at the beginning of my testimony or the, the, my opening statement that uh, a couple hours ago that our economy is growing faster than China's, let me ask a few simple questions about gas prices. Uh, we've heard a lot today about gas prices from both sides. Just a few yes or no's. Does President Biden set gas prices? No. Does Congress set gas prices? Not as far as I know. Do you as chair of the Federal Reserve set gas prices? No. I wouldn't ask you to assign a sort of quantum responsibility, but starting with the decisions of OPEC and the world's major oil companies to not produce more, can you tell the committee um, briefly what goes into the price at the pump and ultimately what tools you have, Congress has, other government agencies have to bring the price down? It's really principally the, the price of oil, which is set globally by the actions of large, largely by the actions of large oil producing countries. And then it's the, you know, the, the, the refining spread, what it costs to refine and what the, what the refiners can charge uh, to, before the public consumes that, that refined product. So that, those are the two pieces of it. And we, we don't have really, our tools certainly don't work to address uh, either of those things. Uh, let me talk for a moment about housing. Uh, several have asked about the skyrocketing costs for both renters and aspiring homeowners. Uh, prices uh, over the last two years, but prices weren't that great prior to President Biden in the last administration either, we know. Last year alone, rents went up more than 11 percent, grew faster than wages. Short, what are the short-term and long-term effects on inflation in our economy if renters see more and more of their monthly income going to housing? 
that will crowd out other other kinds of spending, and that that's you know the, the very fast increases in housing uh, prices over the last uh, couple of years have been very broad across the country and and you know unsustainably high. And that, of course, speaks to the importance of building more housing. Uh, last question I want to ask before adjournment: We've seen cryptocurrency values collapse by some two thousand, so by some two trillion dollars in markets crash over the past few weeks. Consumers losing money, workers losing jobs. The monetary policy report highlighted the risks of stable coins, digital assets that aim to maintain a stable value in order to trade cryptocurrencies. Talk for a moment, if you would, about the financial stability and monetary policy risks that these assets pose, and how are stable coins different? In your answer, include how stable coins are different from the U.S. dollar, which has the full faith and credit of the United States behind it. A stable coin is a is a, an instrument, really, that is backed up. In it. There's a there's a, a reserve that has um, securities in it that are meant to to assure the value of that, uh, you know, of what's, let's say it's a dollar stable coin. So it's, it's meant to assure that, that, that your interest is actually worth a dollar. So that sounds a lot like a money market fund, for example. And, and the way money market funds work is they're very, there's great transparency about what's in the reserve and their requirements about what must be in the reserve in order to preserve that, that one dollar value. The, the world of stable coins is, is new and emerging and, uh, uh, it doesn't have uh, the, the, the sort of fit-for-purpose regulatory scheme that it needs to. And I, and I think that's something you've been hearing a lot across the board from uh, a number of federal agencies and from, from our own Treasury Department, which has been leading an effort to, to try to put in place. And I, many members of Congress now have proposed new frameworks for regulating stable coins and digital assets generally, and that's, that seems like a, a wise thing. And you don't... The, 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 Clearly SEC, clearly CFPB, um, other agencies, the Fed's role in regulation of cryptocurrency, in your mind, is what? Well, that's, that's one of the issues, is who, who really does have authority over this, and that's something c Congress would need to clarify. What we, we, would, we have authority over what banks can and can't do, some banks and bank holding companies. Uh, the SEC has some jurisdiction, has jurisdiction over securities. The CFTC has, has relevant jurisdiction. So part of this will be sorting out, deciding what these things are and how they should be regulated. There are also, there are stable coins that are really used in connection with the crypto trading platforms. That's most of what happens now with stable coins. But there are also some stable coins, and, and even more potentially, that will be used in payments broadly. So that would be two different kinds of regulation there. It's just an area where Congress... And, and Congress is investing bandwidth and, and pro looking at proposals and something like that. And, and that, that's, I think, a healthy process that should lead over time to something that has bipartisan support and puts in place appropriate regulation for the whole, the whole area. Let me drill down for then my last question. What, so what, what if Congress doesn't act on, uh, I understand that uh, the, the Commodities Future Training Commission understand what you said about SEC, does the does the Fed is the Fed directly involved in any of these regulatory actions uh, regarding cryptocurrency absent Congress action? Just just the what you know we regulate banks, regulate and supervise banks, and so we we have a say in what our banks that you know the uh, Federal Reserve regulated banks and bank holding companies do with crypto assets on their balance sheets, what activities are permitted and that kind of thing. Does that of course, suggest, the OCC is, is at that table, and so is the FDIC. Does that suggest that, uh, that a number of American banks are cautious because of your oversight of them on crypto? I, I mean, American banks are interested, in, are now very much exploring, are there profitable opportunities to serve our customers in this new space? And, of course, what we're doing is saying let's be sure that that takes place in a way that, that preserves and supports safety and soundness. And we've, we've had a, a, you know, a ongoing set of meetings and collaborations with the FDIC and, and the, the OCC, and the, that's ongoing, I guess, between us and the OCC. So that, I think that's, that's an appropriate way to carry it forward. But it's not a substitute for what I think is, a, you know, it's, it's, it's not like it's, it's like any other major area of innovation. Ultimately, Congress will come together to create a regulatory framework that, that is 
more fit for purpose for it, as it has in, in so many other cases. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, Chair Powell. I uh, look forward to continue working together. For senators who wish to submit questions, those questions are due one week from today, Wednesday, June 29th. To Chair Powell, please submit your responses to these questions for the record for no more than 45 days from the day you receive them. Thank you again for your testimony. The committee's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.